Christy for this invitation. I, heard, I first want to say, I hope this finds all of you um, and uh, your, your families and your communities um, navigating through this uh, pretty unprecedented time. Um, I certainly enjoyed our, our time together at various uh, conferences and Betty Haywood is joining us here online. So grateful that I've been able to be part of our extended uh, community and I really uh, am grateful for the time with you here. Um, we uh, had, uh, like you, a very challenging uh, moment in our personal lives, our lives, you know, our personal lives and our lives uh, through this time. And we very quickly, um, you know, it's just like into a very cold pond, right? All of a sudden, you realize that everything is dramatically different and feels incredibly different. All the things that we uh, were in process of um, of doing completely changed, and um, we uh, we looked first to the reality of how people were experiencing and learning music. Um, because we felt that um, that was a lifeline for people. That was also a lifeline for the um, for the um, sustainability of music teachers. Um, our NAM members who run uh, have music retail stores, and many of them they offer lessons. So it was a uh, it was how could we keep the the communities together? How could we? Um, help facilitate um, the startling effect that this had on everyone. So if you want to move to just have a few visual slides here for you. Uh, the next slide, we pretty much uh, flipped the switch in the states on about Mar on March 12. Um, the th Thursday and Friday before we had um, schools and NAM, NAM member companies uh, lesson programs, conser community conservatories that made the decision on a Thursday, the Thursday before that um, they were closing um, and pretty much lessons and activities started the following week, March 12. We have some pictures here of the, the new world that started for everyone. Uh, a lot of folks were dabbling in this world. They were experimenting with the combination of online and, and um, uh, in-person, uh, online as a supplement to the in-person training and teaching, uh, but this was 100% flip. And we had some very strong leaders in the um, in our community that, um, that went out very aggressively and I had things already kind of set up in a certain way with studios, with cameras and studios and and good sound qualities and and of course everyone was deciding what, what platform, was it Zoom, was it uh, Google, was it um, Face, FaceTime? Um, there are a lot of schools that were also, uh, well, all of our schools um, went into um, online learning. And of course, in the US, we have a very robust um, music education program in schools. So that was part of the, also the, the, that was a real intensity because these are really established and traditional music classes the general music, bands, orchestra, choirs. And there was, um, though there had been some solid professional development over the years for supplemental online learning, this was a plunge. This was a deep plunge. So we were reading the, um, you know, the, the skyline and understanding and feeling the anxiety. And then we decided very quickly to go out and pro provide some webinars. Uh, so the next slide, if you would please. Um, this is just a summary of our webinars. I think kind of um, um, starting um, from the second one down was our first one, and then we did subsequent uh, webinars. The very first one, Making, uh, making Music Online, no, I, actually it was, um, oh, the first one on the bottom, Bridging the Gap, Teaching and Learning Music Online. Um, we went out within about four days, four or five days in the week of March 12, I forget, you know, this, there's, this all feels like a blur when we, because we wanted to go out quickly because to address the anxiety, we had 16,000 people register for that webinar and we had capacity for 5,000 and we were right at 5,000 the whole webinar. Um, and then we sent everyone a recording of the webinar afterwards. So the recording of this webinar um, is available and this is where I think the, we kind of released the pressure valve 
um, because the, mostly the, the studio teachers, um, because they were doing one-on-one -on -one instruction, there seemed to be a little bit of a more natural transfer to the communication online. The school music teachers that were teaching general music classes and larger groups, um, and they wanted accountability to their school administration, and they wanted to show progress in curriculum, and they wanted to show that they were um, a valid um, subject and part of the whole of the of the school. Um, uh, they were really thrown into a place where it was very unfamiliar to them. So that was very important. Um, then we did a second one on making music um, in, in private less private and group lessons. Then we did a, the third one on the ensemble experience, which of course has been the, um, the most, uh, most challenging in many ways because of the latency of the internet and that the reality that one really does not rehearse together online. Um, but then how those techniques could, uh, could be adapted. We had the, um, uh, the director of the Philadelphia Children's Choir uh, come on, um, on this webinar and it was really wonderful how as a very traditional serious uh, choral conductor with a really solid um, remarkable program how he had adapted the support for um, his students online you know from that large ensemble uh, gathering uh, so there are a lot of lessons learned which I'll, I'll go to on it in a moment but the last thing we did um, is we launched Virtual Choir 6, which is ongoing right now. And this is with Eric Whitaker. Many of you have seen his um, Virtual Choirs. Um, he wrote a new piece and it's in open now. It's acquiring singers and we encourage, um, and we really did it to, to unite and make people feel connected with interconnected and that people of all ages and um, all over the world could uh, join into this effort and we would encourage you to you to participate as well and we also in this we asked uh, we did a webinar with him and we asked him to kind of break down the the mystique of the virtual choir because we didn't want um, uh, school administrators looking at their teachers and saying well why don't you do one of those things why don't you you know have your ensemble go out and break the internet with the virtual ensemble um, so we, um, in this webinar um, uh, with ensembles, we actually had some music educators from our state of Georgia who done a, had done a virtual honors band and they brought in the editorial artists, the, um, the editing artists, video editing artists, because that's what it takes. It takes wonderful musicianships and great music learning, but to do the virtual experience at the end, which we're seeing now all over the internet, is uh, requires a tremendous um, capacity for video editing. So we wanted to, we put some, in, some information out for our music teachers to basically say, yes, this is a beautiful end product, but it's not what you are probably trained to do. But we have to manage the expectations that that's not the end zone of this time. The end zone of this time is connection with students, robust music learning in a different format, uh, deeper music learning on some levels. So just a couple more slides. Um, what really was the breakthrough was uh, right at, at the time of the first um, at the first webinar, a Facebook group, which was kind of a, a middling Facebook group sort of operating in the background of a lot of things. There was a music uh, tech, music educators, music educators creating online learning Facebook group. I think uh, uh, before we did the webinar, it had like 2,000 members, and now it has 41,000 members. Um, and there's an advocacy sub portion of that. We encourage any of you to access and join this group. It is a monitored group, and we, we know the monitors. Uh, they're music educators, experienced music teachers, um, a couple of NAM members that, that, that was vetted by the music educators with a lot of techno music technology savvy and understanding. Um, and what it helped, how it helped us a great deal is because from the NAM perspective, we were not going to endorse or promote any specific tools or platforms. Um, but this Facebook group is where these tools and platforms were offering demos and, and support groups and special online learning on those, dem on those platforms. 
So it was very um, effective way for this group to, you know, almost like you think like a trade show, they're able to kind of gather, they're able to go down different channels or different platforms and they could demo, they could get help with, with things. They could be, you know, it's like a, they were having their own conference every hour of the day. Uh, and it really, really helped everyone to, um, um, to, to, uh, to, to get the tools they needed. And uh, that, that uh, was something we wanted to lead people to the edge and then this was the place they could jump into. Um, and, and of course our schools were also defining what their online teaching policies were gonna be. Some teachers in our country were not allowed to teach online. Um, we had the old, old fashioned um, um, packets, you know, instructional packets of paper being sh sent home with kids or people were coming by schools. Instruments were locked in schools and they couldn't get them. Um, so there was a lot of sorting out. Um, a lot of NAM members actually, because uh, uh, they know their inventory, what students have, what instruments generally, when they rent instruments, they um, actually went and delivered duplicate instruments to front porches or um, they had school drop off days for repair, uh, you know, all contact less. But um, that took a lot of time to uh, to sort out. Uh, so the so the the next the next slide I think the what our teachers were learning um, uh, was that um, it was very possible to have robust online interaction with students, um, and that that fear factor left the room fairly quickly uh, because kind of that's what we had, right? I mean, you you kind of have to have this level of acceptance that yes let's let's make and it is important so the passion and the commitment that dedication to learn and teach uh, never left the room it just became a different room um, we also found with the um, so there's a lot of music making going on and a lot of um, a lot of time a lot of extra time people are home right the pressure of a child's schedule, all the things that children are doing and have, you know, there was just a lot of focus and our teachers were finding that um, uh, there was a lot of uh, a deep, deep learning opportunities with students. On the ensembles, it was, you know, much more um, uh, kind of, we say frustrating because you couldn't have that wonderful acoustic moment, right? And you weren't standing shoulder to shoulder. Uh, uh, doing the or you know, music stand and music stand doing all the things but uh, we were we were hearing from like really our band directors that were running these you know you know I call them the intergalactic honors bands you know the ones that are such you know remarkably talented students and um, that they were uh, they were doing um, uh, listening exercises they were doing score analysis together they were doing ear training um, they were doing sight singing work. So, uh, and I've I said to many of them, can you manage, ma imagine what that ensemble will sound like when they do come back together and they will after they have had this deep, uh, deep, deep learning. I think that I, uh, we've been, we are so focused to the ensemble experience and the performance is the deadline and the, and the end zone or the, the goal. Um, that we forget that there's these deep, deep learning opportunities along the way. And I think that's really what has sustained our teachers is to shift the reality of their work um, to be truly substantive about all the things that music represents. And our national standards, which we do have, support this. So they were really able to go back to our na national standards, look at the scaffold, and say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do more composition with my ensemble students. I'm going to do more improvisation. Things that maybe in the curriculum of preparing this, these robust ensembles, that work really couldn't be done. So, what does the future look like? Oh, that's the next slide. Just a, a quick little view. Uh, we are working right now on our back to school guidelines. Um, uh, we have our, our Center for Disease Control in the U.S. Um, unfortunately, it's been somewhat politicized, uh, but these guidelines are available and schools and governors who are really uh, working in the states here on setting the guidelines for um, what schools will look like uh, is really being set up right now. We had a webinar yesterday about 
what music education will um, possibly look like in the fall as schools are looking at socially distancing um, school environments. And I think that's true in Europe as well. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about ensembles. Um, and we are now together with uh, the National Music Council and a few other um, organizations sponsoring a study on what's called aerosol distribution. We need to have a better understanding on, on what that air looks like around an ensemble. Um, because frankly, that's going to be one of the things that we're able to um, de define or describe as we, um, um, as we go forward. Um, and this study, quite interesting, I just read the narrative for it yesterday, builds on the SARS research. So there was all, already a concern about um, aerial distribution, aerosol distribution um, relative to uh, theater, making music, speech, speech competition, debate, um, all the things that are part of our school environments. And how can we continue with those activities when we are committed to child safety and the safety of every person in that environment uh, until we come to a, we come forward and science carries us forward to a new for, to a different time so at the um at the most important part of all and this is my final slide is that we learned uh in over and over and over and over um that music is connecting us and music is sustaining us and music is um, it's the, the format and the uh, the process of teaching is different, but the content is more powerful and important than ever. Uh, and the work that your organizations is doing, you know, part of our um, part of our commitment was just to to dig in and struggle through, to dig in and um, you know, bring the people who had the same questions together and to create a, um, a, a way forward through this time. Uh, we are now working, um, just really starting at, uh, Tuesday on our webinar, we're starting to push our U.S. federal government to uh, provide relief funds for our state education funding. We are really, our, our states who are the primary supporters of education, um, uh, could potentially have a really dramatic um, shortfalls that would trickle down and really impact curriculum and uh, impact whole learning for children in schools, and certainly including, including music. Our cultural organizations um, uh, are through our National Endowment for the Arts. So there's a lot of advocacy now uh, to bring this forward. And we've also uh, encouraged um, folks in their communities to go immediately to their school leaders and their community leaders to start the conversation that when school and community come back together, these experiences are not um, sidelined or eliminated or, or diminished. Um, it, because this is the heart, and the heart of learning is in music and the arts. And our children have gone through a, a a pretty intense time and we know social the social and emotional learning and the social emotional capacity to support our children is uh, central to the power that music gives them in their lives so um, we're just grateful for our community um, uh, with all of you um, and some of you have been with us at the NAM show I've been with some of you at the uh, the IMC we're so grateful for the hard work that uh, they we're all doing together and we're all pioneers in a new world together and we welcome your interaction and your ideas as well so thank you so much thank you very much mary and thank you for for being available for us what time is it in your, where are you in the U.S. at the moment? I, I'm, in, I'm in New York and it's just about a second cup of coffee time, about <laughs> nine o'clock, so it's all good. Okay, perfect. No, thank you so much. I would take um, two questions now um, so that we can continue. Um, if anybody has a direct question, please use this raising hand button. Okay, I don't see any. Are you ah Betty? I see you. Come on. Uh, I have a, not a question for Mary. I have a, uh, an additional comment to make. I thought um, what you you said is uh, really resonated um, in, in terms of the anxiety of all the teachers because 
Some were really good at technology, some were lousy at technology, some um, were really worried about going on screen, some were um, embarrassed about it, etc. And in, in a webinar that you did yesterday, I thought a very nice thing was that the National Association for Music Educators, Lynn Tuttle, mentioned that um, a, a silver lining out of this is that all the teachers have managed, that she knows of, all the teachers are managing to share the best experience and best practices. So there is none of the sort of um, rivalries, jealousies, um, etc. in their day-to-day -day work sort of translating into this. Suddenly this is they all working together and um, I'm hoping that everybody will remember that afterwards. Thank you very much. Important, important comment. Um, and I assume we will uh, try to put all together. I hope that we can also um, forward your presentation, Mary, to the people and so that we can have access to the Facebook group and everything that you were saying, yeah. I think is probably really a takeaway from, from what you have shared. And, and all the webinars have been recorded and they're all on the NAF Foundation website and you're more than willing to, to access them and share them. Great, thank you so much. So I have Marina uh, Gall from the University of Britain, Bristol and the EAS. Hello. I think my, my question's just been answered that second because I want to know a lot more about ensemble music making and the best tools, um, you know, to, uh, platforms to use. So um, I think I should get to the NAM website. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you know what? The next presenter, Sonia from the European Choral Association, um, will exactly also tap into uh, the topic of ensemble music make making in the online environment with COVID-19. So I give the word to Sonia. Thank you very much. Um, I will start by sharing my screen to show you something. I hope it's working. Um, so I Secretary General of the European Call Association Europa Cantat, and obviously we deal only with ensemble music making, or mostly. And um, I'm very grateful for a lot of things that um, Mary said because I can connect to that very well. So obviously, also in our world, after an initial shock, people tried to look at all kinds of digital tools that might help them. And um, at the same time, they realized that what is the very core of ensemble music making is actually make music together. And with most um, digital tools that we have available at the moment, this is not possible. I'm sorry if my screen is a bit blurred. I'm, I'm just going to explain quickly what it is. You don't need to really see it. And we will make this document public next week. So we started by gathering for our members um, a, a list of useful tools um, to see um, which tools exist at the moment to do digital rehearsals, um, to do digital teaching, et cetera, et cetera. And I will certainly add the NUM webinars to this list because I think they fit our audience very well as well. Um, we also talked about virtual choirs and I can fully share what um, uh, Mary has been saying. There's a lot of demand for virtual choirs, mostly from people who are not from the world, let's say from the, the music uh, the, the directors of the school saying, why don't you make a virtual choir with your um, school choir, etc. But now and you find more and more articles um, on social media saying, but a virtual choir is not a choir. It's people singing alone at home and only the people who see the video have the impression that they have a choir. Plus, it's a technical challenge for a lot of people. Um, so starting from the fact that we were also looking, of course, and we are now looking, so I'm also very interested in the research that Mary mentioned we are looking at how will it be possible for choirs to perform together again, or at least to rehearse together again in some form. And because aerosols are so central and because there had been stories of some choirs where a lot of members got ill, we are quite clear that for a while it will not be possible to get back to the normal rehearsals with 50 or 60 people in a cramped room with no air. However, the first countries have developed protocols on how to maybe start rehearsals in small groups or open air. And there are a lot of creative ideas that we will gather in this document, also like car rehearsals, for example, that use FM transmitters and stand together on a parking space and can actually sing together. So this question of collective singing has been at the core of our work for the last uh, weeks. And in this process, we discovered a new tool, and I hope that the quality will be a bit better here. Or maybe I should move this to another screen otherwise. Is it still blurred? No, okay. 
I'll try the video, but I have to stop sharing again because I have to share the sound settings as well. Just a second. Um, um, so we we discovered um, a new program that is being prepared, and that was developed during a hackathon, um, which is a meeting of IT nerds, um, um, which was about what can you do in COVID times. And I will start by playing this video, which gives a little explanation of it. Corona Crisis 2020. Corona Crisis 2020. Concert halls and theaters are closed. No more joy of live music in venerable halls or cool locations. What is an orchestra rehearsal in times of physical distancing supposed to look like? Well, we have the solution. Digital stage. Digital stage is a point-to-point -point solution for live feeds, immediate musical enjoyment instead of canned recordings. Conventional conference services usually offer good video, but rarely do they provide a useful audio transmission. Automatic compression, mixing, muting, and delays make rehearsals and performances with anything more than four participants difficult. We were able to reduce the delay in streaming to milliseconds so that real musical enjoyment is possible. And the best thing about it is, this tool can also be used for rehearsals. The team behind it consists of musicians, theater directors, a software developer, and a graphic designer. The digital-stage.org website is ready for the community. Beta rehearsals are ongoing, and you can even sign up to participate in testing yourself. Join in and bear witness to musicians playing from their living rooms or studios. We will be there watching them. With Digital Stage, you can be there when musicians play from their living rooms or studios and experience their art instantly, as close to live as digitally possible. As you can imagine, when we heard about this, we were very excited because they seem to be answering the main question we have in our sector. And that was, um, how can we actually make music together online? Because you have to know if you have not tried it yourself, if you do a Zoom rehearsal or Jitsi or whatever. Is the nationalsocialism emigriert über London nach Brasilien und er lebt heute in Robion in Frankreich. Yeah. Um, so um, we realized that um, all the rehearsal methods we have is practically a unilateral rehearsal. It means the conductor speaks and plays and sings and the singers sing along, but they're singing individually at home, which is not very helpful for the process of uh, singing together. We looked at the program at their proposal and we decided to become their partners because we felt that this was something that was worth um, looking into more. So. Um, we have now, um, I hope you can actually see the presentation. It's always difficult because what you see is different from what people see. But um, yes, um, so we looked into how far they got. And I mean, they're still in a development phase, but their aim is to be able to at least allow groups of, let's say, 15 to 20 people, probably not uh, 50 or 100 people, to really rehearse together online. And Mary mentioned what is the biggest hindrance to this at the moment, which is mostly latency. Um, but I will show you a little bit more about that. So here you see the current partners of the project, and they will be happy to welcome more partners if other music or performing arts associations are interested in supporting this idea. And so they went from the problem, people would like to rehearse and perform live together online because they can't do it offline at the moment. However, most of the programs that we are working with don't allow that. Now, there are a few programs that you may have heard about called Jamalus or Jamkazam or Soundjack, where let's say little pop and rock bands, for example, have already been making music together online, but they usually have very low restrictions, um, like you can only play with three or four or maximum eight different people. And um, sometimes you need a very sophisticated program. So for example, I was recommended use Jamalus, but actually if you want to use Jamalus, you have to set up your own server. So you would need an IT 
technician in your choir and obviously most amateur choirs don't have an IT technician that is able to do it. And then some of the other programs, there's for example this LOLA, the low latency um, uh, connection between different universities, but that requires extremely expensive equipment on both sides. So you're going to like 25,000 euros um, for the equipment for each music university. So it's not something that a choir could um, work with. And what we found interesting in this specific proposal was that they are offering three different options. Um, and the first option will be a browser-based option, which is obviously the most interesting for amateur choirs and amateur orchestras because you can just click on a link and you can connect each other through that. This might not be totally latency free, but they assume that the latency can be brought down enough to make it possible to sing together. Um, the second version will be a downloadable and local application. At the moment, they're experimenting with um, Soundjack, but they might also experiment with Gemelus and see what um, can be done there. As I said, this will already require some more IT skills, a little bit one, but it will still be free for certain people. And then there will be a, sto a standalone hardware um, uh, with a USB sound card. It means you can buy a piece of equipment that might cost about 200 euros and that you can use without the computer. It comes pre-installed, it's kind of plug and play. And then you have the best result um, for playing together. So that may be an option, for example, for vocal ensembles small ensembles that are professionals and for whom it's a very important option to play together and maybe even across countries which is also something very important for us. So um, this is the more technical um, uh, explanation of how they hope to bring the latency down um, but they're also addressing issues such as auto compression, level balance, echo cancellation and optimizing for music rather than speech you will have noticed, for example, at the beginning of this um, lounge that some people had not muted their microphones and when they were doing something on their computer, they cancelled out Mary, so I couldn't hear Mary anymore. And that's the principle of Zoom, the loudest is the one that is being projected. And of course, that would be counterproductive for a, a common rehearsal where you want to hear people, everybody together, and not just the loudest two singers as it would happen on Zoom now. Um, and then also Zoom is optimized for speaking because it's, it's a software that was made for meetings and not for music and you can adapt your sound settings a little bit and there's somebody from Denmark who has done some tutorials for this but it will still not be optimized for music. Um, their aim is to say that freelance artists and institutions organizations and their members of the non-profit sector will have the first two options, so the browser-based option and the app-based option for free. Um, and the ones that want to use the device will have to pay for the device. Um, you will have to register through an organization or something like that because they want to avoid that the platform would be used by people from outside the sector who want to use it. And there are probably certain limits um, as to how many people can use it at the same time. So they're at the moment in the testing and fundraising um, period, so they are already testing things with little choirs, ensembles, um, have been doing radio presentations about that as well, and at the same time they are fundraising because everybody is at the moment working on it as volunteers, and of course then at some point there's a limit as to what they can do. And um, when they will have received a certain amount of funding, then they will start going online two weeks later, they assume, so they hope that they will be able to launch this in about two months time or so. Um, we still think it's going to be very important even in two months time because we can see that in many countries there will be no back to pre-COVID-19 normal, there will be a back to new normal as we say in Germany, meaning that social distancing will remain the rule number one probably and also the fact that you can only put so many people into a closed room with so many square meters and all the recommendations that we have are based on for singing you need minimum five, minimum 10, minimum 20 square meters per person. Now you can make a calculation with your choir how big your hall would have to be if you want to have a rehearsal with your full choir. So as I said at the beginning, we know that we will not return to full choir rehearsals for quite a while and that might be an in-between tool to help us with everything. In addition to everything that Mary said, it will also not replace the fact that you can do wonderful music education projects also with your choirs now, but to at least fulfill the one aim that most people want to have to be able to make music together again. 
And I think that's enough for the presentation today. So if you're interested to look into it, I think um, probably the European Music Council will also share the presentations and you can go to digital-stage.org and you can find everything and you can offer yourself as testers, as they said in the video, and say, I would like to test um, um, digital stage with my group or with five people or with my little choir and they will tell you how to do that. And I think maybe that's it for the moment, if you have any questions about it. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, very direct practical tool um, that you have decided to, to work with. I will take again two questions and then we continue. If you again use this little hand raising tool and then I'll check if okay if I don't see your hand you just speak up but I don't see anybody so we it's fine <laughs> yeah I mean we will share ah yeah Ruth, Ruth is having something did you want to say something good <laughs> If I may, I mean, I definitely don't want to be first, but if there's now what nobody else, I would um, just very, very practically, um, is this also available for music teaching? Because of course, latency, I can say from practical experience with my own kids being taught their music lessons at home is a huge problem and equalizing down and sound quality and everything. Yes, so definitely. So um, they are actually cooperating also with a number of music universities. And as far as I know, AEC is also um, discussing a partnership with them because obviously, yes, it's easier to use it for music education. So my guess would be one-to-one -one, um, teaching is probably the first thing that will work well with that. Um, um, then um, small ensembles and the biggest challenge for them will be the, the size of a choir of, or an orchestra. Um, and I would also say that the more professional people are, I think if a professional ensemble buys these boxes, they will be very near to zero latency because of the device they use. The browser-based version may be less successful. We, we still have to test it. They haven't been able to test the browser version yet. They are at the moment testing the app version where they have had some successful tests already. So yes, definitely. I think, and also by the way, the theaters. Um, so I've, I've put the focus on music for this specific lounge, but it was actually the first institution that supported them was the um, theater institution, the ITI, and the theaters are very interested in this program as well, and they get, um, they're also supporting this initiative. Great, thank you very much. Just because you mentioned AEC, I just want to say something on the AEC, uh, European Association of uh, Conservatoires. We asked them also to be part of our lounge today. However, they are currently, since yesterday and today, having a big on online conference on actually music education tools online. And um, we are in touch with them and I'm sure a lot of what they have presented as speeches and things will also be online and if you're interested we can also share you know their database and resources with you later because I mean yeah it's obviously a hot topic and they are having a full-fledged conference unless whereas we are rather more the the smaller exchange however not 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 less important I would say but that's the reason why they are not with us today now I give the word to Ruth to moderate the second part Okay, thank you, Simona. I saw Barbara who had a question before, or yes? Well, um, Sonia partially answered that. I was indeed curious to know how much um, was the tool uh, used in it for other disciplines, because of course uh, I will be talking about that. Uh, so she partially used that. And I saw also maybe if Sonia can also just briefly mention about, I saw that it's part of the EU funded project. It was that initiated by that, or was it a collaboration? Probably the no, hackathon. It started um, uh, at a German um, hackathon. It was a hackathon, I think a German-Swiss hackathon that was um, started by the governments. And they also joined uh, an EU hackathon at the beginning of May and they are preparing two EU applications or aiming to apply for two EU applications. They're actually waiting for the new call that was announced for May to see if it would fit in there. And they are also trying a call, um, an application under Horizon 2020 and they're applying to different funds, etc. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, that was my son saying hello to all of you. That's what Home Office with Little Children is about. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much, um, Sonia and Mary, for, for your presentations. Um, we will now go to more um, broader um, points of discussion um, and not only looking into the great tools and the great opportunities that have been developed, but maybe also looking at some challenges that, of course, still occur and will remain with, uh, with all this digital living and digital training. Um, Thils Kopa, I would like to give you the word first to talk about a study that you have been conducting with the European Music School Union. Yes, okay. Well, um, first, thank you everybody for having me. Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily a, a study that we did, but more of a survey um, when, 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 when this whole situation with the coronavirus started. We had some discussions, of course, within the EMU about what our role would be and what, what kind of service we can bring to our members, we can bring to the music schools in Europe. And um, our first idea was, of course, also to start to put together a list of resources and of, of useful digital tools that enable distance learning, online learning, e-learning, whatever you want to call it. But um, we realized that um, uh, as you say, necessity is the mother of invention. And, and um, by the time we started thinking about it, we realized that um, many music schools had already switched to online learning and there were already so many um, tools and lists of tools out there with resources for online learning, for um, music education online, that um, we realized that the national associations and the music schools themselves are pretty, are, are can help themselves. and. To be brutally honest, most of them have more resources than the EMU has. So what we did was to compile a list of lists of online learning tools and we sent this to our members hoping that it would be helpful for them. But we rather thought that we would try to assess a little bit how music schools are dealing with the situation, um, if they are continuing their activities, um, how, how the coronavirus has affected them and so on. And we drafted a little survey um, I have to say we only scratched the surface a little bit. It's not a very, um, a very long or very extensive survey and doesn't go too much into details. Um, we were a little bit afraid that since our members are very busy at the moment, they would maybe not have the time to answer correctly to very long surveys. So we asked some basic questions. And um, we were lucky to get answers from 22 um, European countries out of 27 European countries that are member in the EMU. So that was really encouraging. I think probably 90% of our membership also answered. So we were really happy to see that. And um, yeah, if I, I, I will maybe just share my screen and walk you through some of the findings. Um, as I said, it's just a very basic um, uh, assessment of, of how music schools are dealing with the situation. But what we said to our members based on the findings from the survey, we would look into going into more details about specific topics, um, about um, specific type of pedagogy, about specific tools and so on. So let me see if this works. Share screen. Um, is this working? Yeah, I think it is. Let me see. So. Um, the, the survey that we did was answered, um, as I said, by, by 22 organizations. It starts off with um, I, with a list of all the different org organizations. And maybe I have to say a few words about how the EMU is structured. Um, we do not have any direct members. We do not have any music schools as members. But um, in almost all European countries, there are national associations, sometimes um, several associations. Um, that gather all the music schools in one country, and they are all members. So um, it starts off with a list of all the members that have answered to audited survey, um, 22 of them, and we have asked them some very basic questions. So it starts off with whether the crisis has affected the organization, and um, all of them said yes, or partly there's one that said no, but in the, in the following questions, they also um, indicated that indeed their music schools has have uh, switched to online learning. So um, 
they have actually also been affected. Maybe the question was mis, uh, misinterpreted or something. So it has affected all the 22 countries that answered to our organization. And we asked them in an open comment field to elaborate a little bit on the ways that it was affected. And obviously the most common answer was that music schools had to close. The second most common answer was that um, uh, events, concerts uh, and other public events had to be cancelled or had to be postponed, of course. Um, and then there were some answers from our association that said um, they had to deal with budget cuts for the music schools. Some of them stated that they have started um, new campaigns, new new lobbying advocacy initiatives to um, well encourage the, the authorities responsible for them to support the music schools. Um, some of them had to, to deal with questions of how to handle a decline of students, which also leads very often to a decline and to, to, a, to lowering your budget of the music schools, of course. And um, these, these were the kind of answers uh, that we got. It's not necessarily very surprising, but it was interesting to see that um, they all had to deal with more or less the same problems. Um, then we asked whether music schools continue their um, their activity in this period. And actually there was only one single country that said, no, they are not continuing their activities. But in the following question, they also elaborated that they had switched to online learning. So I think they have elaborated, uh, interpreted this question as, do you continue business as usual? Um, so in a way we can count this as a yes. And it's interesting to see that all music schools um, uh, including Italy, Spain, and, 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 and these countries that have been hit most hardly by the crisis, they've all continued to give lessons in one way or another, which was really interesting insight, I think. Um, we have asked a more pedagogical question. Um, we asked about e-learning, and, and basically what we meant was digital tools in the broadest sense. Do you use e-learning, distance learning, online learning? Um, and they all said yes. Um, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one tuition from face-to-face, -face, from, from teacher to student. Um, this goes for um, theoretical lessons, for individual um, instrumental lessons and so on. The situation is quite different when you look at group lessons or band practice or orchestra practice. Um, and uh, well, the reason probably is that there are technical limitations and um, I guess this, this connects my presentation a little bit to what Zonia said. There seems to be a strong need for tools that allow um, playing together, rehearsing together, singing together, making music together online, because there is apparently no really good solution at the moment. And the answers were a little bit mixed in this regard. Um, this has not so much to do with the, the, the content of, of today's launch, but we also asked uh, um, a few questions on the um, economic effect of the crisis. And um, we asked where music schools think they will have to make budget cuts, whether it's rather the administrative stuff or um, rather the teachers. And um, well, most music schools were quite optimistic, you know, saying that we do not believe or um, not yet that we will have to make any cuts with regards to administrative staff or teachers. But the next question was quite interesting many of them believe that their budget will indeed be affected. So um, uh, it's too early now to, to draw conclusions as, as we cannot assess what the, the, the economic repercussions will be in the end. But um, this already indicates that there will be a problem and that they will have to find some solution on how to handle um, the, the budget cuts that have taken place. Um, and finally, we asked another question. Um, when music schools think they will be able to resume their activities, and the answers were again quite mixed. Um, many of them said that, well, we will start with smaller classes or one-on-one -on -one tuition um, as soon as May, and then step by step, we try to return to normality. Um, but almost half of the members said that they hope sometime between August, September, which means after the summer, with um, the start of the new school year, basically. Um, Maybe what was interesting to see um, in, in this report is that the, the, the topic of digitization and of, of digital tools in, in music schools, it has been on, on the agenda of the EMU for quite a while. And I think it's, it, it is a hot topic for, um, for music schools. 
But uh, until recently, when we spoke about um, about digital tools and music education, digital tools and music schools, um, I, I, we had the impression that the expectations from the music schools and for our members were quite diverse. So some wanted to know about what kind of tools there are, um, what they can be used for and, and how they work and so on. And others wanted to discuss quality and some wanted to discuss how does digitization affect the administration of our music school or something like this. So it was also very, always very tricky to, um, to deal with the topic um, in, in, in a way that reaches everybody and that is interesting for everybody because everybody seemed to be on a different level of, of implementation of digitization in their teaching. And um, it seems that from one day to the next, everybody has uh, started online learning. I mean, I think this was the most important outcome of the survey. Everybody has, has set up, all countries have set up online classes and have started to use digital tools. And now everybody has an opinion about it. And uh, there is a huge amount of experience that was gained more or less from one day to the next all across Europe that we can now dig into. And I think we can now turn the page about what kind of tools are out there. There might be some missing, as Sonia said, but um, in general, I think it's, it's pretty well known all across Europe. And we can now um, move on to discuss questions of, of quality in, in, in online learning and questions of um, what kind of pedagogies work well for um, online lessons, what kind of new pedagogies might be developed that work well, what are the technical limitations, and, and again, what kind of technologies might be developed that um, help us to, to overcome those <coughs> things that are there, bless you, at the moment. And um, yeah, this, is, this was the, the major outcome, uh, uh, I think, uh, or, or the most interesting thing for us is that we can really start to, to, to um, take, we can really take up the discussion again on a new level. Um, I'm uh, also, I've seen that- uh, Sorry. Yeah, please. No, I just I thought you were wrapping up, and I would I wanted to take the opportunity, you know, also to make sure that we can have uh, the the other presentation and maybe some questions. But of course, uh, just round yeah, up. Just about to say, I mean, I initially planned to 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 uh, to share this discussion with our president in the EMO, Philippe, and uh, I've just started talking. But um, I think Philippe also wanted to add a few words. So can I just pass it on to Philippe really quickly? That, thanks for the over for um, handing over. That would have been my my next uh, speaker, of course. So welcome, Philippe, and thanks for for joining us. So what would you have to add to um, to Tilt's uh, presentations, or maybe further further questions to open for the debate? Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very, very glad to be with you all. Uh, Till made a very good presentation of this survey. Uh, and I have to say that, um, as, as he said, we have got 22 answers and 27 national associations, which is an excellent rate uh, and also shows the level of, um, of concern about the situation and the need of sharing information as well. So this survey, as you saw, is a first um, general approach on the impact of coronavirus concerning the pedagogical and also uh, the economic life of music schools. And according to the, the, the success of uh, this first survey, I think we will make it other, other ones on more specific topics. For instance, uh, uh, of course, the e-learning tools and also the health measures to be taken when the schools open again. But not to be long, I would like to underline that the, this survey shows in general that music schools, directors and teachers have been very reactive and creative since the very beginning of the crisis. So that um, we can say that in every country in Europe, music lessons continue to be given by e-learning. And um, just to, to finish, this is more than important because we know that students and families' reactions have been very positive to this. And it is also the reason why music uh, is bringing so, so much comfort and social connection in this period. So it was a first survey, uh, as I said, I think we will make other ones, but it's good to have su such a, an approach of, of what happens in uh, uh, every country in Europe. Thank you for your attention. 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Philip and, and Till. I already, we have Mary who would like to ask a question or make a comment. So I, I would take one more then be, before we pass the word to Barbara. Um, and then hopefully we can have a final round of, of questions. So Mary Lurson, your, your question, please. Yes, I just have a quick update. Um, our Centers for Disease Control did advise our organization and the National Association for Music Education on instrument hygiene. Um, how long the virus uh, can maintain on an instrument case. Um, and we're working to refine uh, the next process for that. That information is also available at nafoundation.org. And we are now working with our European uh, counterparts to, um, to um, take it to, the, to, to a level of a recommendation. That's been very, very helpful to us that, you know, that an instrument is not the source of, um, of um, after a period of time and, and good maintenance, an instrument is not the source of contamination. So I invite you to look at that document and if you have any comments, we would be welcome to collaborate with you. Thank you. While I check if there are any other comments, which doesn't seem to be the case, again, a very personal piece of information, Music School in Bonn will start again with presence teaching and present lessons for individual teaching, of course, as of next week. And they have a complex hygiene plan, and I don't know, I'm sure they circulate around the VDM. Um, and then certainly also at EMO level, that's maybe something that not every music school has to, uh, to define for themselves, and also making uh, use of, of Mary's comments, um, use common, common knowledge here. So I just check, I don't see any further hands. So I pass the word to Barbara with sharing some experience outside the music sector with us, which is, I think, also very interesting. And then please already, you can think of your questions um, and then we will have a, a final round um, after, after Barbara's presentation. So Barbara, the word is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you for having me today. Uh, so let me just very briefly indeed introduce who I am. I'm Barbara Revelli. I'm head of membership and content at Elia. Elia is a uh, internationally, globally connected with a European network for higher education. And indeed, we do not work only in music like our colleagues in uh, AEC that have been mentioned before, with whom, of course, we collaborate, but we work on all artistic disciplines. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say, comparing to uh, what we were talking about uh, just before with EMO, we work at higher education, as I mentioned. And indeed, we exist since the 30 years. We're going to celebrate online, of course, our 30th anniversary. Very briefly, in the, at the end of the year, in November, with our main conference, which is also gonna go uh, virtual. And as you can see from the slide, we are mainly European, as I said, though we have members in 47 countries and we represent about uh, 300 students. And we have about 250 members, which you can imagine are not just conservatoire, but indeed academies and university in all artistic disciplines. Um, indeed, what we do is, of course, a lot of it is what also Emma mentioned before. Uh, we also, of course, ran a survey and it was actually interesting to see um, the, the link between education in a broad term. Uh, we also had a relatively good response from our members and we did see how, indeed, in general, they all converted to to digital teaching and before I move on indeed I would also want to underline how the e-learning and the digitalization process that at least in higher education very often has been a debated question and now because of the need like learning a language it just went very smoothly and very fast and what we do as you can see from the slide we mainly work on strengthening the position of higher education in the arts so uh, also with advocacy actions at european level at the national level but of course we mainly work on supporting their work uh, so we normally do that of course through uh, sharing knowledge peer-to-peer -peer learning and um, and of course, as you can imagine, like everybody, we also had to convert our events from uh, physical meetings to digital meetings. And that's indeed what we did. We already had uh, about nine uh, webinars uh, so far uh, on different topics. Again, very interesting to see how there is a, um, a, a connection. Of course, the main issue at the beginning was very much supporting our members, university and, and uh, uh, institutions that they had to convert 
teaching from face to face to um, to digital. So the remote uh, working and the conversion was, of course, what we uh, focused on. And I will talk a bit more uh, now. Uh, but of course, we also talked more specifically on uh, other topic like the health and well-being of student staff uh, and also something that has been mentioned also before, the, the, the quality assurance of the courses and more specific as aspects like mobility and internationalization. Um, and of course, returning to the spaces which also have been uh, mentioned. Uh, maybe also interesting for you to know that as in music and in the performing arts uh, in general, there are very um, huge limitation because of this, uh, these constraints. The same can be said for other disciplines, especially when it's about producing and making. Uh, has the choir cannot get together or the dancer cannot get together in the same way. And when we're talking about ceramics or fine arts, they have the same issues because they can just simply not get to large machineries that we, they would normally access into their uh, institutions. But as I said, I'm going to focus mainly on uh, emergency remote teachings and, and the tools. Um, so first of all, what came out very fast was that we should not expect our teachers to deliver the same kind of content that they would normally do online. The face-to-face -face teaching and online teaching are two different universes and we should not make the, the all one thing. They're not the same, they don't work in the same way and also the learning experience is not the same. And that was actually very important, not only for um, the students to understand that their experience is different, but also for the teachers. We had lots of teachers that at the beginning, they were saying that they were getting, of course, very stressed because they expected to have the same kind of impact and that's just not possible. So I think that realization was very important for our members to, to come to. And, and then, of course, we, we moved to, um, despite the debate I mentioned before, so how um, if we keep separated physical face-to-face uh, -face teaching and digital teaching, still when we are into this situation, we cannot, we have to convert. So then the main point was to say, well, how do we do that? And as I mentioned, first of all, we were very impressed of how university and academies, despite the national regulation, they very moved a very fast move to uh, remote teaching. And this was uh, very briefly what we sum up as the main outcomes uh, of what the institutions and the teachers should focus on. The first one being indeed expecting um, uh, understanding what is the expectation from the side of the institution. And that has a lot to do again also with uh, the process of, of quality assurance. Uh, if we are expecting to keep the same level of spectrum of education and hours and etc., then um, that might be might be difficult. But when we prioritize, that would create a lot of clarity. And also, um, again, as the second point, especially focus on is making sure that inside the organization uh, there is a good understanding and an awareness of the skills that the, the colleagues are, are possessing. Very often, for example, in a university context, it might be that there is a whole e-learning department that, of course, can support the rest of the teachers or other colleagues. And that's also, of course, what we tried to do uh, was indeed to share uh, experiences and um, supporting the teachers in learning from, from each other. Um, I'm going to also touch, touch upon the very last uh, point. So the, the feedback approval, that's something that emerged a lot, being very important. As I mentioned, because the teaching is not the same, um, teachers have asked a lot more than normal the feedback approval, just simply because uh, it's a different context. And actually that return into a, a different kind of learning, uh, but also a different kind of communication that uh, gave lots of good results. And this is one of the examples that we uh, got from one of our members. This is the, from the head of, um, of master programs from the uh, University of Applied uh, Sciences and Arts in Lucerne. And uh, Jan Eckhart uh, created, basically what this institution did was uh, stopping their program for seven days. And they were actually, his words, he said that they were not very strong on, on e-learning, on, on digital teaching. They stopped for seven days and they focused these seven days to create a plan. 
And the power of this blueprint was not only to give, again, clarity and information to the students, but also to their staff. And, and doing so, they created a, a path, a blueprint, so that everybody could follow a sort of a checklist and also blocks of content in order to guarantee uh, clarity. Again, lower the stress, lower the um, uh, emotional and improving the well-being and creating again a, a good pattern uh, for, for both sides. Uh, this is another example I'm very briefly touching upon coming from more the performing arts in Hong Kong. Uh, so um, the assistant HPT director uh, Michael Lee showed us a lot of, of what they have done there and indeed in a similar way to music how uh, other disciplines in the performing arts have used this digital tools to keep on practicing and, and rehearsing and they, their main focus and this again it's a pattern that came up from many institutions was how can we use this context to, uh, to, to our own advantage and advance maybe uh, the parts that we couldn't uh, do so much and see this as an opportunity and and now we are also I'm very fast moving on to the tools This is actually a slide that he showed us of the tools that they have gathered and I would very much agree with the colleagues of Emu. They are a lot. There is a lot of content available online and again their emphasis was very much into not so much um, looking for uh, the tools, which of course uh, they are also available, and I'm, I'm also gonna show you where you can find it on, on our website. But it's also very much into focusing how we can um, make sure that the collaboration and the organization of the work of the teachers and in between the teachers and the teachers to the students, none of us or many of us and this is why this list is extremely long as you can see um, why is that is exactly because there are lots of tools available uh, that can help us communicate better between uh, colleagues when normally we would just do that at a, at a coffee machine um, but also can improve the communication with with the students and uh, and that's of course um, uh, a lot of it um, different than, than what we would do normally. So here is just a list of indeed how we have organized this content. And again, I would want to underline that the way in which we work in a remote way is of course very different than how we would do it in a, in a normal class. And, and many of you have showed the examples of one-to-one -one teaching. Uh, but even the one-to-one -one teaching as much as also the practices going back to spaces um, that require, will require us to work in a different way, demand a, a much bigger uh, planning and project management and collaboration, which we might not have needed before. And, and that's why that aspect is also been emphasized uh, a lot. Um, a lot of our, uh, all these tools are available uh, on our website, as well as the recording of the past uh, um, uh, webinars, though you might have to request those, but we will be happy to provide it uh, uh, for you. And, and maybe again, I would like to touch very briefly upon uh, what also uh, the colleagues in MO have mentioned before. Uh, indeed, also we have published some, some of the results we had from our survey see indeed how we have to focus indeed much more on, on on the process of, of uh, what, how we can plan our, our future of teaching. And has, as they have seen in, in, uh, in the music schools, we've seen the same, of course, in higher education, especially in certain countries like the United Kingdom, there is a huge um, threat on the budget because they are limited by the, the students. And, um, and that's, of course, general and especially music of course and that's why we are uh, advocating a lot at European level as well but I think that's also why uh, as association and networks we can uh, collaborate as much as possible and and make sure that the art is not uh, put on the side because as have been mentioned at the beginning it's um, it's actually the one that keeps everybody alive in these moments of confinement um, so that's very much about it and feel free to ask any question if you have um, and again, everything is available on our website. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Barbara, for this impressive uh, presentation, the impressive uh, uh, list, of course, of tools as well, but also the 
the various thoughts that you have been sharing. Just um, I, I take two key messages actually from your presentation. The first one is online teaching is just not the same as, as uh, present teaching. Um, I think this is very important for everyone um, to, to keep in mind. Um, and also connected, of course, to the well-being, I might say, not only for the, for the teachers, but also for the students that, that receive, I mean, that, have the, that are taught. Um, and the second one is it demands time to prepare. And I think what you have been reporting is a very brave but very wise decision to take a break of a week, which is really not long to prepare everything. No, they were really Also to say we cannot just just at once change flip everything from 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 our normal business to everything online but we need time to prepare and we take this time and during that time we can't do we can't go on with the normal uh, stuff just online as well i think this is very very important and maybe a very um, important recommendation to to some schools or or what 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 might it be um, and if I may add just very, so two I, very brief things, there is one, two more very brief points. One is it indeed that what has been mentioned, the quality assurance of the, of the courses, which is indeed what the next focus should be on. And the focus is also on the, the second point, which is maybe splitting uh, the teaching to what can easily yeah. be converted to online. So that's then the guarantee of the quality. And the other part is what cannot be, because of course, performance will have to get together, then, well, that also requires a big planning and time. And that's what we can start to do now for the future of thinking, well, if we want the students to go back to the studio, we want the students to go back to the theaters, how do we do that? So. Mm. Any, any questions, any comments to Barbara also, if you have been thinking of questions to the other presenters, um, we can try to replace Sonia as good as we can, or we can also take questions to Sonia who had to leave already and pass, it, pass them on to her. I see some hands going up. Let me just check. Thank you. So um, there's Marina Gall, Gall again from Bristol. Just go ahead. Sorry, I didn't have my you mic. You have to unmute your mic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, if there is a, quest a direct question, I should wait. But mine is more a general point to make to everyone. So shall I make it now or wait? No, just go ahead, please. Um, just to say that um, perhaps it would be really nice to have another, another opportunity to meet because myself and Till, who's just spoken with you, are part of um, an AEC, EMU and EAS um, joint collaborative pro project in which we've carried out research across Europe. Um, initially, before COVID, it was to find out about practices and not only musical, but systems for management, etc., which use technology related to music teacher training and to music in schools. And um, we've already gained some, um, some feedback on this, and we're working with, we've worked with the data already. And our next stage is to go further with this, to ask about um, the same sort of projects in response to COVID. So there is going to be a lot of data that we've got in, which we are going to present in papers and online. But um, I'm sure that people would be interested because this will cover a whole range of, of musical issues and management issues. So um, we'll let you know about that for the future. Till, I didn't know if you wanted to add something else to that. Yeah, no, sorry for not bringing this up again. Yes, but um, of course, this is something that we forgot to mention before. Um, the joint working group between EMU, AEC and ARS. Um, uh, I coordinate the group. Marina is one of the members and there are five other members from all across Europe. Um, just maybe to give some, some, some uh, information on the project as such, it is incorporated in the um, network funding project of the AEC that runs from, I think, 2000. Uh, 17 to 2021, we collected a lot of data on um, especially higher music educations, but also music schools and how they use digital tools. And um, we have received almost 100 answers from all across Europe. And um, when we started to um, process the data that we have received, um, this whole Corona situation started. And <laughs> in a way, it was a complete game changer. But I think um, uh, we will put the, the information that we have used, uh, that we have received before the crisis, and the new information that we are gathering right now into a good use. And maybe it will help us also to, um, to get a clearer picture of how the crisis has affected music education institutions. So, uh, yeah. 
this is this is something that I forgot to mention earlier. And uh, just another thing, if uh, this is also something that I forgot to say during my presentation, if you want to read the report, it is um, public, it is online. Just um, go to the website of the EMU Music School Union, one word, musicschoolunion.eu, and you will find the report on the front page. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, as we can see, there is a strong need to further exchange on this. We will look into opportunities um, either by the group that you have just mentioned, Till, or maybe also EMC can offer something something new. We have to check, of course, um, in, ter in terms of capacity, etc. But thanks for, for sharing this and we will make sure to have all the information available um, online. I have seen Ian, but I'm looking for if there is someone else to, but this does not seem the Okay, so um, Ian, Pres Ian Smith, President of the European Music Council. Thanks for yes. being with us, as yeah. always, Thursdays at this time. Yeah, I could say I, I have no choice, but I'm delighted to be with you and thank you everybody. And thank you everybody for the presentations. It, it's just a couple of additional little bits of information. CNAR is known to many of you as the Canadian Arts Organization. I've just published a survey on the international mobility uh, of uh, artists, which is worth looking at. It just came out this week. And the other one to mention, many of us would be at Classical Next next week, but of course we're not. Uh, but Classical Next, the in Innovation Awards, they are streaming them live on Wednesday. And again, the details are on the Classical Next site, which I'm sure will be of interest to, to many of you. Okay, thank you. Any any other questions or any other comments? This does not seem to be the case, which is fine. We will we will try to Ilya. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Just go ahead, please. Addition... Just in addition to um intervention. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Um, I will. The International Music Council has already facilitated connection for the U.S. National Music Council international connection with uh, other organizations regarding this study uh, on the aerosol um, diffusion dissemination. And uh, we will soon be reaching out to IMC members uh, across the world for uh, possible support, uh, moral support, financial support to join this research alliance uh, to, um, in order to be able to have scientific uh, insight into this uh, question and uh, just uh, stay tuned and look out for our next email. Thank you. That was the wrong way around. Thank you, Zilia, Zilia for sharing us. Um, as it seems, I don't have full access to the to the hands up. Simone, can you? I don't see any others. No, that okay. So I will I will wrap up now this this session. Thanks thanks a lot for being with us. As I mentioned before, we will look into further opportunities with our European agenda for music. We also had a webinar kind of planned but not totally identified defined um, with um, European Music School Union, European Association of Schools and uh, European Association of Conservatoires to look into uh, music educa education and of course looking into online tools makes, makes sense now. Um, please, if you do, we, I'm not sure that we have all of the participants in our participation list, so if you do not get the recording or if you don't get the access, just uh, send us an email. Um, to have um, uh, access to the recording um, and whenever there's any other issue don't hesitate to get in touch I think that was it otherwise I give I look at Simone if she would like to add anything um, this does not seem to be the case okay well then we leave it here um, we have the next lounge next week we will um, no not next, next week there, there won't be any um, but anyway, we will keep you informed about future EMC uh, launches for formal or informal exchanges. And um, we wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.